Welcome to Energized, a podcast brought to you by G Zero Media's Blue Circle Studio and presented by Enbridge. I'm JJ Ramberg. At the end of the road is just a single individual who wants to have a clean planet and clean water and something to pass on to their kids, but are also terrified that they can't afford to feed their kids or pay rent or put gas in their car. So we're all kind of stuck in terms of knowing we want to do the right thing, but terrified of the cost of doing the right thing. So far on this podcast, we've explored big ideas about the current energy transition and how it could impact geopolitics. Today, I want to get down to brass tacks. What does the energy transition actually look like in practical terms? Renewables like wind and solar are the fastest growing energy sources on Earth. And that's thanks to research and development by both startups and legacy energy companies. But the energy transition is about more than just technology. It's about strong public policy. Governments and businesses need to work together to combine their respective strengths. And that's how we'll build a future that's both environmentally and economically sustainable. Later on, we'll be talking with the Honorable Lisa Raitt. She's the vice chair of global investment banking for CIBC Capital Markets and a former member of the Canadian Parliament. But first, let's check in with Enbridge CEO Greg Ebel. Greg, when we look at climate change and the effects on the world right now, it's clear we have to make big changes and we have to make them fast. But obviously, easier said than done. So what does that actually look like in practice? Well, you know, you used an interesting word there, JJ, fast, because we're talking about the world, we're talking about eons, we're talking all of history where we've come from. So fast in the world of uh, cars is very different than the world of, uh, say, climate change. So instead, I actually think it needs to be more of an evolution. It's going to look like an evolution as opposed to an instantaneous transition, from my perspective. Fortunately, There's a real steady and logical way for us to do this. And I think you see little pieces of that. And it has to be steady and logical. Why? Because it's got to be balanced, right? We have to balance affordability. I mean, look at the time we live in. Everything's more expensive and everybody's up in arms about what it costs. It doesn't matter what it is, but energy is a the element so it's got to be affordable it's got to be secure security for you and me in our home security in our neighborhoods but security globally and geopolitically and as we know that's a real challenge whether you look at the middle east whether you look at russia some places where energy is produced and have been relied on in other places are no longer secure so it's got to balance that piece and then where you just started It obviously has to lead to the right solution from a sustainability perspective. But sometimes those elements, I think, are in great conflict. And if we stick to the absolutists, the climate deniers or the climate catastrophists, if we stick on those sides, I think it's going to be really hard to come to a solution that's actually fair for people, for consumers, and obviously logical from a geopolitical perspective. But we got to know where we're going. We have to have that balanced approach to it. And it really means meeting those different near-term balancing elements to be able to achieve that long-term goal. And it's got to look like that we're showing humility, both to the earth and our position in it, but to our fellow humans who are all in different spots on this transition trail around the globe, right? For, you know, one community's uh, discussion of transition, if they've only ever used coal, might mean getting to oil and gas. Another, where they've changed largely to gas, might mean how do we use more and more renewables? But they're going to be different in different places. And I think it's going to be really hard if we want to get that balance right and we want to make it fair and equitable, then I think we're going to have to meet people where they are because we we don't have different goals. We just have different paths to get to that goal. It's going to take a lot of us to swallow our own preconceptions about what good looks like. You talked about what fast means, Greg, and I understand that and really take that into consideration. But I also know that when we are forced to make a change, when our backs are truly up against the wall, we can make it faster than we ever could have imagined. And nothing showed us that better than the pandemic. So things that we never thought could have happened, happen overnight. 
So how do we get companies like yours to feel like we're running out of time and we need to make changes faster than we might have thought was possible? So I'm thinking about things like the Inflation Reduction Act. So for those of you who are listening who don't know what that is, the Inflation Reduction Act incentivizes businesses to invest in green energy, but it also makes it more affordable for regular people. So that's tackling climate goals, and it's also bolstering the economy. What do you think about that, Greg, and how or do we need more of this? Yeah, for sure. Look, I, I think it's a great start. The Inflation Reduction Act changed the climate discussion and climate transition and energy transition from one of sticks and regulation to one of carrots and incentives. I don't know about you, but I think people are driven by incentives, right? It doesn't matter what it is. So I think uh, companies are no different. They are just functions of all those people. So if we can keep creating those incentives, so the IRA is great. Let's not put all the requests on government, though, right? I mean, that doesn't always work out well. Uh, sometimes it does. Sometimes it doesn't. But let's put the pressure on companies themselves, two ways. And we do this at our own company. We put out a sustainability report for the last 25 years, and it keeps getting more fulsome. So that's one that makes public commitments that companies like to follow through on. And then incentives, actual incentives in the compensation. My compensation, and this didn't happen before three years ago, actually is tied to a reduction in carbon intensity. Not my entire compensation, but the incentive compensation, which is also a big element. What gets reported gets measured. What gets measured gets paid, right? That's an old saying for anybody that's got an employee or has themselves or kids. They want to get tasks uh, to get done. Well, Mother Nature might be looking at us like tasks, so let's make sure uh, we create allowance and incentives for people to go out there and get it. That's how I look at it in any event. After talking to Greg, I really wanted to understand more about how these changes are made from a policy perspective. So we reached out to the Honorable Lisa Raitt. Today, Lisa is the Vice Chair of Global Investment Banking for CIBC Capital Markets. But previously, she spent 11 years as a Member of Parliament in the Canadian House of Commons. Lisa served as Minister of Natural Resources, Minister of Labor, and Minister of Transport. Which is to say, she knows a lot about the politics of energy. I wanted to talk to Lisa about the unique characteristics of the energy industry from a policy perspective and how we can get governments and businesses to work together to build a cleaner, more prosperous future. I want to start the conversation talking about Canada, since you have great perspective coming from Canada. And Canada is such an interesting case study when it comes to energy transition, because it, on the one hand, has all of these amazing natural resources, oil, natural gas, and they play a big role in the Canadian economy. But you also have some really ambitious goals, as the world does, around reducing emissions and being more sustainable. And you have spoken recently and loudly about how important it is to not let sustainability goals have a negative impact on Canada's economic growth. So how do you balance those two ideals? So let's start from the frame that Canada's biggest emitter in the country is a significant size of emission, well over 200 megatons, and that's the oil and gas sector followed number two by transportation, followed number three by buildings. Very different situation in the United States where number one emission source is transportation. And what you can see then is policy is developing around tackling emissions in the biggest sector. So for us, we're really focused on oil and gas. We know what the number is that we have. We know what we'd like the number to be. And now you got to figure out the ways in order to bring that number down. And you have to work with private companies, meaning the oil and gas companies, to get to that point. So it has become very much, I would say, in the past 20 years, a top of mind issue. And it kind of bumps up against the fact and reality that without oil and gas exports, without oil and gas production in the country, our country would be poorer. So in order to bring down the emissions, you can't just stop production because the production is important to the economic prosperity. So that's the quandary. And different political parties will push on the brakes or will push on the accelerator. And as a result, we seem to be talking about energy transition a lot. I would contrast with the United States, where when I go to Houston, my feeling is people look at energy transition as an incredible opportunity. Whereas in Canada, we're really worried about what the orderly transition will will look like. So how do you balance 
the economic prosperity side with the true and honest desire to reduce emissions in the oil and gas sector. Well, you need to have a long-term plan is what it comes down to. And you need to recognize that both things are important. How do you change that attitude into getting oil and gas companies to think of it as an opportunity? Oh, they do. They absolutely do. They think it as as a great opportunity because in Canada, we believe that we can produce the cleanest and lowest emission barrel of oil going forward. But here's the thing. What it all comes down to at the end of the day is who pays the check. And from the government's point of view, they believe that the companies should pay. And from the company's point of view, they don't believe that their shareholders are going to be very happy about footing a very expensive bill to bring in carbon capture and storage, for example, when it's government policy and government decisions that are driving it. It's not a market yet that's driving this move to emissions-free production. It definitely is public policy. And the problem is, is that there's only one payer at the end of the day, and it's citizens like me and regular Canadians, either through tax dollars that we send to Ottawa, or it's how much we pay at the pump or how much we pay to fuel our houses or to heat our homes or actually buy anything because it's all tied up into the energy cycle. So the cost, the affordability of the transition really is top of mind. It is important to note that Lisa's perspective is just one way of looking at the complex conversation around energy, sustainability, and affordability. There is a lot of disagreement among politicians in Canada, and frankly, around the world, about how to best move forward in the energy transition. One example is Jagmeet Singh, the leader of Canada's left-wing New Democratic Party, or NDP. During his 2021 election campaign, Singh said that if elected, he would end all federal fossil fuel subsidies and redirect that money towards renewable energy research. While it might seem unlikely that people from across the political spectrum would be able to find common ground here, Lisa has personal experience that proves it's possible. One of the issues is that in policy conversations, energy transition is often discussed in very black or white way, right? Either we keep everything the same or we drop all the current technologies and switch on a dime. And so how do we get policymakers, really everyone, to think in a transitional mindset? I wish I could answer that question really clearly and simply. But what I can do is I can give you an example of where it has, I hope, worked. There is another, I would say, major crisis we are facing in Canada, and that is to do with housing. The cost of housing is completely out of reach of the younger generation, either millennial or or Z or for certain alpha. So there's been a lot of think work done around this topic. I was a co-chair of a task force that came together last summer, the task force on housing and climate. And the thesis of this task force was to bring together academics, public policymakers, business developers, as well as former politicians in the guise of myself and Don Iveson. So I'm a conservative. Don Iveson is a former mayor of Edmonton, and I would say that he leans much more to the left than me. And we brought this cross-partisan approach to dealing with serious issues of housing and of climate, because if you are to build all the houses that we need to build By 2030, we're going to put 100 megatons of GHG emissions into the atmosphere. And here we are trying to reduce that. I mean, that's double the amount of transportation emissions we put up now. And we're going to do that just by trying to catch up on an economic development issue. It would be very easy for some people at that table to say the path forward is to prevent gas hookups from ever happening in new builds. But other people at the table would say we really can't do that because we need it for economic prosperity. And we, we certainly need it because we just don't have the infrastructure built to electrify everywhere. That conversation happened. And where we ended up agreeing was to disagree. However, it wasn't part of the recommendations. There was an agreement that you have to kind of balance these things off of one another. And we came up with other recommendations that had to do with where you're going to build, how you're going to build, and what you're going to build, as opposed to focusing on something which can grab headlines like you're no longer allowed to have a gas stove or propane is evil. We don't want anybody using it again. 
stay away from that stuff and focus on the things that we can do. And the task force, I think, work governments took up a number of the recommendations. So to answer your question, is there a possibility of doing it? Yes. Where is it coming from? Civil society. It's not coming from politicians because they are so entrenched in their political and partisan ways. It's hard for them to have that kind of conversation. So we got to call upon civil society at large to try to come together and come up with solutions to then give to the governments. It feels to me that what needs to be built is a conversation where all sides trust each other, that if we all trust we want to get to the same place ultimately, then we can figure out how to get there. That's exactly what it was. That was the thesis of it all, that we all understand that. I, even though I'm a conservative, they could see that I wanted the same goal as them, which is net zero, and I want to be able to make sure that we're reducing GHG emissions. But at the same time, there are other considerations to make sure that we're thinking of that they may not think of. And I may not think of things that they think of. And the trust was important at the table. And we met over a period of eight months to get this done. And it wasn't easy. And I give Don Iveson a whole bunch of credit for being able to bridge some divides that happened along the way. I want to build on this idea of trust again, because there is some thinking, you know, black and white thinking that says legacy energy companies should not have a part in this transition. And that, again, is about trust. And how do you feel about that? What kind of role should legacy companies have? Do legacy energy companies have in the future of global energy? I think that's old thinking. And I'll tell you why. That was the thinking before capacity and leadership came from First Nations. And in Canada, all roads to resources, all roads to energy transition lead through the lands of the Indigenous peoples. They just don't want to be necessarily only beneficiaries of these kinds of benefits agreements that can be sorted out between the energy company and the First Nation or the Indigenous community. They want equity and they are raising billions with a B of dollars to be part of gas transactions, to be part of oil transactions. They have ownership. They'll have revenue streams. Why they're interested in this is not just about the money is they want to have a say on the land. They want to be there at the table for the conservation aspects. They want to make sure that they're part of the environmental discussion so that there is no question about how the project is going to happen. And now the reality is, is that the partner that they have in all of this is the legacy energy company. Those are the relationships that are being forged right now is between indigenous groups and the legacy energy companies because they have the capital for the project, they have the infrastructure for the project, and they want the project to go ahead. So I think there's a whole new world now. And I do believe that it's energy companies who are doing these deals and building the relationships and the trust directly. Relationship building is just one aspect of what legacy energy brings to the table. Bigger companies also have resources available to them that smaller startups often don't. One area Lisa points to is research and development. What you'll see is a lot of the legacy companies are some of the earliest investors in, for example, wind technology or in in technology around the use of solvents that are going to clean things better or any other kind of clean tech that is possible out there, oftentimes that they're involved in those. You know, and I'm not here to be a, a cheerleader for the legacy companies, but I can see the fact that they do have big market cap. They do have the resources. They do a lot of research and development, a lot of innovation, and they they still have to answer to shareholders and their shareholders are telling them that this is a direction they want to go in. So they will put out their sustainability reports and they'll talk about their other investments. And they're not doing it because they're seeking to get social buy-in for oil and gas. They're doing it because they see that there's going to be a change in how the world is using energy in the future. And they obviously want to be part of it. The best way to sustain yourself in a world that's changing is to move ahead of where the ball is going or the puck is going in the case of Canada. Are they investing enough and doing enough R&D and is it happening quick enough? 
I know that there's been some really exciting developments. I know that the in Alberta, which is the home for our oil and gas production, they have really diversified in their economy writ large, and they have a big clean tech economy. I think Enbridge just did a deal with the First Nation on a wind farm as well. You know, these are all things that are happening because there's an awareness. Also, I mean, let's face it, the Inflation Reduction Act has just supercharged investment in clean tech and in energy transition related technologies like carbon capture. And those are areas in which oil companies and gas companies are very invested in and very interested in. Let's talk about the labor force. The energy sector employs, I believe, 12 million people around the world. And the transition has the potential to create a lot of new jobs, but there's also this existing workforce with a lot to offer. And so how do we transition the workforce? Minister Wilkinson, who is the Minister of Natural Resources here, he said, and I agree with him, that he's not worried about displacing workers and not having jobs for workers as much as he is about not having enough workers for what's coming. And I'm going to agree with him on that, because what I see is if there is going to be a change in production, a change in the way we do things, less production maybe in the future, who's to say? The reality is current workers are going to age out by attrition because the average workforce age is higher. But on the other side of it is for whatever is going to replace the energy ecosystem or the energy infrastructure, it's going to be important for us to be able to build it is what it comes down to. And we, we're going to need construction people involved. And, and a lot of times the trades can move from oil and gas and into construction in a very seamless way. And then the other side of it is hopefully we'll see a lot more work on productivity and we'll be using AI more. And what that will do is not decrease the number of jobs we have. It'll just open up new avenues and new venues for new jobs. That said, I think we would be remiss to think that this is a smooth transition and that we have to be prepared for some bumps in the road, whether it's workforce, energy, providing people energy, just this transition as a whole, I imagine will be quite bumpy. The energy transition will take longer than everyone thinks. It will be more expensive than everyone thinks. And it's going to create winners and losers at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Those are facts that we have to deal with. I don't know who the winners and losers are going to be. I do know it's going to be more expensive. And I think what is holding us back in Canada is we're having, I wouldn't say a disagreement, but we're really having a hard time coming to terms with who's going to foot the bill. I really see it that way. So, for example, carbon capture and storage, the technology works. It's been proven. It's something they can put in place. And everyone's just kind of balking over how expensive it is and who's going to end up taking the risk associated with the with the cost up front. Well, you, this is what you've done. You have years of experience in both policy and the corporate world. And so how do we get policymakers and businesses to collaborate so we, A, move faster and further along this road to energy transition, and B, somehow create a way so that there are as many winners as possible? It's very interesting because you've got two different sets of individuals. You've got the people who vote and you've got the people who invest in companies. And there's a Venn diagram where in some cases they're the same person. They overlap with one another. Not all voters are shareholders, but all shareholders are pretty much voters or electors. As a result, you have to be able to talk to both of them in a sense to ensure that they're both comfortable. A voter has to be able to see that what they want to have done environmentally is something that they can afford. And the shareholder has to see that the something that everyone wants to be done environmentally is not going to take away from their investment. And that's the fundamental balance. But at the end of the road is just a single individual who wants to have a clean planet and clean water and something to pass on to their kids, but are also terrified that they can't afford to feed their kids or pay rent or put gas in their car. So we're all kind of stuck in terms of knowing we want to do the right thing, but terrified of the cost of doing the right thing. And right now in this world, geopolitically, as you know, we have a lot of external forces that are making life really expensive. So you do have people saying, well, the now is far more important than the future. 
Before we started taping, you and I had a, a quick conversation, and I was saying to you that in learning more and more about the energy sector, I'm thinking about how complex it is. And your reaction to that was, maybe it shouldn't be as complex as it sounds. Why? What do you think we're doing wrong? I don't think the energy sector is very complex at all. I think it is actually quite stable. There is good governance. There is a lot of regulations that protect health and safety and the environment around the production of it. I think we do it right in Canada in terms of oil and gas production. I think we have landed in a place where we accept that depending upon where you are in the country, you are naturally inclined to have a different energy source and that's acceptable. So on the East Coast, you're gonna have oil fired electricity because that's what is available. In Quebec, you're gonna have hydropower because that's what they have. In Ontario, we have nuclear, Manitoba is hydro. Saskatchewan, Alberta, again, is fossil fuel and BC is hydro. You know, we're not the same geographically across the country and each of us are gonna have a different system in place. So that's not the hard part. The hard part is how fast you wanna to move to a transition. For example, if, if you wanna electrify, the case in Ontario, Ontario has a pretty clean grid for electricity. It's a very clean grid, actually, because it's got non-carbon emitting nuclear and you've got hydro and you've got some wind. It's, it's a really good mix. But we also have home heating that's fired by natural gas. And we also have some industries that are fired by natural gas. But most importantly, we have transportation, right? And that's where a lot of the emissions are going to come from in Ontario. So we talk about electrification. And electrification means that you're going to have the ability to buy an EV and be able to fuel your car with the clean electricity as opposed to the fossil fuel that produces emissions. And for us to get to there, the amount of infrastructure that would be needed in the province far exceeds and outpaces the amount of tax dollars that you can raise. And the investment's going to have to come from the private sector as well as the public sector. But the last time we tried to do something in Ontario where we invited more renewables onto the grid, it ended up costing the system and the government still subsidizes the energy system so that it appears on the taxpayer's bill as opposed on the ratepayer's bill. So is the bottom line for speeding up this energy transition then simply money, simply investment? Yeah, it's, it's affordability. How much can the individual bear so, and the individual pays everything. They pay the taxes, they pay the rates for electricity, they pay the fuel to go in the cars, they pay the food that consumes, that uses energy to get to where you are, all of those things. So if your economy isn't keeping up with increasing your wages so that you can pay for these kinds of things, then you're gonna feel it. So what I'm saying is a strong economy is the best way to get to a quicker transition because people will feel they can absorb more. So what kind of incentives do you think businesses need to tackle these issues and to invest more in, in the transition? I think um, given the size of the Inflation Reduction Act, I really don't think that there's a lot of room for innovative Canadian public policy on how to incent companies. The investment dollars are flowing to the South without a question, and that's an okay thing because we'll benefit from it in the long run. But I think what the one thing that governments can do for companies is to ease up on processes that don't make sense anymore and figure out ways to speed up approvals so that they can get things done or make it easier to do your taxes or you know, make it easier if you wanna get an investment tax credit, make it easier for you to be able to get it through the Canadian system because the difference between what's happening in Canada and the United States isn't as much about what public policy pieces we put in place because they're very similar to one another. It's just that in the United States, you're much better at deploying it efficiently than we are in Canada. So it's not a monetary thing that businesses need. It needs regulatory certainty, a willingness of the government to move things along quicker, and uh, a recognition that um, all of this paperwork isn't necessarily going to reduce emissions at the end of the day. And yet, many people would think that the transition is not happening here in the United States fast enough either. That's interesting to me. I think you've done remarkable. I know it's hard to see the end products, you know, conversion from coal to gas and coal to solar, that kind of stuff. 
but uh, you're reducing your emissions and yet you're growing your economy. So to me, that is uh, an incredible statement of success. So the point being, even if it's not as fast as we'd like it to be, we're doing it in a way that's not making the ground fall from under us. I think so. Uh, I mean, I I like faster. One of the things that we said on that task force on housing and climate is the most expensive house you're going to have is the one you have to build twice. So that's the importance of going faster in transition, right? That's the importance of getting it done quicker because it'll be more expensive. Mitigation adaptation will cost more than figuring out how to do a transition a little bit more quickly at the end of the day. But when the whole cost is being borne by individuals raising families or trying to get on with their lives, it's a really hard political sell. When you meet with the people who are leading the traditional energy sector right now, are you encouraged by their attitude towards the transition? Yeah, for sure. I mean, the Pathways Alliance is a group of oil producers in Alberta who have come together to implement carbon capture, utilization, and storage, CCUS, which is remarkable because they're all competitors with one another. And yet they have bound together sharing resources to make the case to the government as to the investment that's going to be needed, what they're willing to put in, what they think the government should put in, in order to have this happen. They talk about it from the point of view of recognizing that they want to have the barrel of oil that has the least amount of energy intensity to it, and that it's the preferred barrel of oil in the world because the world is still going to use oil and gas. It's still going to be there. Why shouldn't it be Canada? And what they're saying is in order to meet our own emission standards, we need to clean it up. And the way we clean it up is carbon capture. And we want to partner with the government and get a deal done. And there it's back to what we're talking about, which is it's just about money. It is a negotiation. I have a feeling I know the answer to this question, but I want to ask you, in in case I'm wrong, you're one of the co-chairs of the Coalition for a Better Future, and you aim to create a more prosperous future so Canadians can have better lives. Yeah. So if you had to pick one thing that is the most important thing for creating a better future for the energy sector, what would it be? We want to be net zero by 2050, but in order to get there, you just can't throw out oil and gas at the end of the day. And by the way, every member of the coalition has to agree to the principle of net zero by 2050. It's a must. If you don't agree to it, then um, you're not part of the coalition. But the overarching thing that I guess we would communicate to businesses writ large is we need to have a plan, a long-term economic plan that makes sense. And I'm just going to go back to the one thing that we talked about before, which is regulatory reform. Having processes that are in place where investors know how much time it's going to take to get a permit and not even get a permit, to get an answer on a permit. Let me put it that way. I'm not saying that you should go out and approve mines willy nilly, but it shouldn't take 16 years to approve a mine for a critical mineral that you're going to need in six years for batteries, right? It's the staging of it all. So if we want to have EVs and we want to produce lithium batteries, which is going to be something really important to Canada's economy, you got to clean up the regulatory side of it so that there is a clean line process with all of the appropriate reviews that need to happen along the way with Indigenous economic reconciliation and consent on the lands. And, you know, get these things done and don't be stuck in terms of um, staring at your feet wondering what to do next because... If we don't figure out how to do it, somebody else will. That was the Honorable Lisa Rate, Vice Chair of Global Investment Banking for CIBC Capital Markets. And thanks again to Greg Ebel, CEO of Enbridge. Thanks so much for joining us today on Energized. I'm JJ Ramberg. To hear more episodes from this series, subscribe to Energize, the future of energy, wherever you get your podcasts. Or visit g0media.com slash energized. Energized, the future of energy, is produced by G0's Blue Circle Studios for Enbridge. To learn more about partnership opportunities with G0, head to g0media.com slash advertise.